06, move into the first floor. Is this game political? No. Really? Hey, 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 no, no, no. No. We'll just make the game. That seems insane. It seems insane to get political to me. Call of Duty Modern Warfare released on October 25th, 2019 and sold $600 million worth of games in its first three days. That is, if we're keeping track, roughly double the amount Avengers Endgame made in North America in the same amount of time. Call of Duty Modern Warfare is the ninth Call of Duty developed by Infinity Ward and the 16th Call of Duty game released in the last 16 years. Call of Duty Modern Warfare is the fourth game in the Call of Duty series to be called Call of Duty Modern Warfare. Unlike the previous year's game, Black Ops, Confusion About Roman Numerals, this fourth Call of Duty Modern Warfare has a single-player campaign, a redux of the first Call of Duty Modern Warfare's campaign with similarly named characters in totally new situations. Still with me? And if you followed Call of Duty Modern Warfare's marketing, you'll know that Infinity Ward wanted you to know that this single-player campaign was about modern warfare. It's not your daddy's Modern Warfare or the Modern Warfare you played 12 years ago. This is a story about proxy wars, about non-state actors, and serious acts of terrorism. These are morally complex stories, where there is no black and white or pure evil or pure good. It's the gray in the middle of all that, and finding your line is a hard thing to determine, says narrative director Taylor Kurosaki. This game deals with some capital T themes. Themes like, uh, colonialism and uh, uh, occupation and independence and freedom. But while this is a game about modern warfare, about colonialism, about occupied countries, about the meaning of freedom, there is one thing it's not. Is this game political? No. Hmm. So to be fair, is this thing political is a question that can be interpreted in many different ways. And to their credit, the writers of Modern Warfare actually gave us a pretty direct explanation of what they feel their game would have to be in order to be political. I feel like for, for me to honestly say, if you wanted a situation where I would say that yes, it is a political story, I would have to be telling a story about specifically the exact administrations and governments and events in our world today. So there we go, a straightforward definition of what it means to them to have a political story. It would have to be specifically about the exact administrations and events in our world today. Now look, everyone can have an opinion on this sort of thing, but I feel like we can also recognize that this definition is absurd. Let's list some stories that are not political by this definition. House of Cards The West Wing Veep Mr. Smith Goes to Washington 1984 Atlas Shrugged Animal Farm Brave New World Fahrenheit 451 Huck Finn By this definition, Jacob Minkoff has made the idea of political allegory impossible. There ain't room for metaphors in this definition. Either you're saying, Donald Trump told me to do this, or your story is not political. There's the cynical way of taking this, of course. It's all marketing language. They know that gamers are sick of having these pesky SJW politics forced into their games about, uh, imperialism. A quick glance at the comments on this Game Informer video confirms it. Hundreds of people celebrating the fact that this game isn't political. The cynical take is that these writers don't actually care what they're saying, or the publishers have told them to keep out of politics. Whatever it takes, as long as it sells copies and keeps their fan base happy. But I think that they feel sincere. And moreover, even if they do have ulterior motives for claiming apoliticism, this interpretation paints a fascinating picture of Call of Duty's base assumptions about the military and the world we live in. First things first, though. The plot in the broadest possible strokes. In a fictional Middle East country named Urzikstan, many forces are vying for control. There's a hostile invasion from Russia, there's a fictional terrorist group called Al-Qatal, and there's the Urzik Militia. 
After terrorist attacks in the non-fictional city of London and the looming threat of chemical weapons by Russian forces, a number of SAS and CIA agents team up with the members of the Urzik militia to stop the bad guys. I played the game like two days ago, but writing out those three sentences was weirdly difficult. And there's a good reason for that. Modern Warfare is a game about individuals. We don't spend time with the Urzik militia, really. We spend time with Farah. She's a leader in the group. She's absolutely committed to her people. As a child, her father was killed during a chemical weapon attack by Russian forces. And so she hates the invading Russians. She hates chemical weapons. She hates being controlled. I remember her character far more than I remember exactly what she was trying to do. Same with Captain John Price, a mustachioed SAS captain who knows that doing the right thing often means getting his hands dirty, but that's a burden he's willing to take. We get dirty, and the world stays clean. Or CIA officer Alex, who empathizes so strongly with the Urzik malicious plight that he literally leaves his post to go fight with them. Or Hadir, Farah's brother, who fights just as passionately for independence, but is put at odds with Farah and the rest of the squad when he uses chemical weapons against Russian forces. This focus on character over story is very much Modern Warfare's intent, I think. The writer said many times that they wanted you to empathize with the individual. This is the story about the morally grave, remember? And you know what? That's fine. Wars, especially the proxy wars this story is ostensibly about, are fought by individuals. Including freedom fighters like Farah humanizes parts of a conflict we often think about only in broad strokes. But Modern Warfare seems to think by sidelining real-life government and administrations and events in favor of individuals, it's able to dodge politics. This isn't a story about Congress or Parliament. It's a story about people simply responding to the situations they're put in. In their mind, the personal cannot be political. But simultaneously, there are constant reminders on the many real-life wars that have been fought and the many thinkers that have stemmed from them. At least there are if you're bad at the game. I die, and Elie Wiesel tells me that nothing can, nothing will justify the murder of innocent people and helpless children. I die, and Jean-Paul Sartre tells me that when the rich wage war, it's the poor who die. I die, and Chris Kyle tells me that it was my duty to shoot the enemy, and I do not regret it. Are any of these quotes what the game is about? Not really. But it's what Call of Duty has done for years, drape itself in non-fictional accoutrement while insisting it can't function as a commentary on any of those things. Modern Warfare uses real guns, real quotes, and one-half real countries. But is this game political? No. Because there's a second part to Minkoff's definition that's probably even more important to their self-identification as non-political. Are you ready for it? Here we go. And governments and events in our world today, we are talking about thematic things. We would also have to have, I think, a perspective on it. And, and what we don't, we, we want to present the different perspectives. We don't want to say that one of them is correct. Call of Duty Modern Warfare does not have a perspective on Modern Warfare. That is their official position. What, what do you even do with that? Uh, colonialism and uh, uh, occupation and independence and freedom. We would also have to have, I think, a perspective on it. Is freedom good? Is war bad? This game has no idea. Come and play the game series named after the phrase we say when we're honoring soldiers, a series completely neutral on the ideas of war. All right, all right. So what's interesting here, taking them at their word, is what the writers of Call of Duty think a perspectiveless story looks like. Early on, there's a mission in Modern Warfare set in London. In the opening of the mission, Sergeant Kyle Garrick and a squad are tracking a potential terrorist group. He asks if there are snipers in place and is told that they don't have a backup because they don't want to upset the public. Immediately afterward, terrorists detonate a van in the middle of Piccadilly Circus. In the following mission, you as Garrick fight through the chaos. 
Terrorists are mixed in with the crowds. The mission is designed so it's exceedingly difficult to not accidentally shoot one of the dozens of fleeing civilians. Once all the terrorists are killed and cleanup begins, Garrick laments that this attack could have been prevented. You saved lives today, Sergeant. This shouldn't have happened in the first place, sir. Eric says that they had actionable intel to stop the attack because they had been tracking this terrorist cell for weeks. The reason him and his squad hadn't was because of they, an unnamed they, weren't willing to take the gloves off. We don't stand a chance in hell with these rules of engagement, Captain. They can tell us where, they can tell us when. Don't tell us how. My men were tracking that cell for weeks. Kyle Garrick has a perspective, clearly. He wants more autonomy for his individual squad, more leeway to use force, more resources allocated to homeland security and terror attack prevention. And it makes sense that he would feel this way. He just experienced the worst possible result of not having autonomy, leeway, and resources. Call of Duty's writers say they want to present the different perspectives. We don't want to say one of them is correct. But how are we as an audience supposed to take this scene? Eric thinks that if his squad had the discretion to take out potential targets without higher approval, he would be able to prevent terrorist attacks. And in this scene, he is proven right on every measure. Sure, the game doesn't force you in real life to agree with Garrick's point, but I have trouble thinking of a way it could more persuasively frame him as correct. The game's standout mission, Clean House, presents a similarly implicit perspective. Clean House is, from a purely game design perspective, a pretty remarkable achievement for Call of Duty. Far from bombastic, this mission is an incredibly tense and quiet path through a single house. Every single room is its own separate encounter. Every bathroom could have someone hiding in it. Every blind corner is a potential bullet. And just like Piccadilly Circus, civilians are mixed in with the terrorists, but even more so. In this instance, a man is using a woman as a human body shield. Assuming you take him out cleanly, he lets go of the woman, who immediately lunges for a gun. Surprise, she was a combatant too. In one of the rooms, there's a woman and a baby. Obviously, you shouldn't shoot them. In fact, if you shoot them multiple times, the game shows a message that says, are you serious? And kicks you back to the main menu. When you finish clearing the house, you find two things at the top a treasure trove of information on terrorist activities, and a detonator. If you hadn't shot that last woman, the whole house would have gone up in smoke. Here again, we have a level that presents a controversial real-life operation, in this case no-knock raids, but also presents a right way through. If someone surrenders, you don't shoot them. If they have a gun, you do. There's even an achievement called Golden Path for going through the house perfectly, using one bullet per viable target. And at the end, it was absolutely worth it. You got information that led to saving lives. Again, the game doesn't actually force you to agree with the actions of the characters here. You could play this level and be absolutely horrified that a state military would carry out this kind of action. You could reasonably point out that it's an understandable response to try and shoot back when you wake up and find your house full of men with guns. You could recognize that the golden path isn't perfect at all, that it's only really rewarding the efficient executions of But if you were to do that, you would be fighting against every message that the game is giving you. In the game, if you alerted the people in the house that you were there, you never would have found that life-saving information. In the game, if you didn't shoot that woman in the head, she would have grabbed the detonator and killed everyone, mother and baby included. The game doesn't say all no-knock raids are effective, but it shows you one, and that one inarguably was. Modern Warfare's writers say they're just presenting ideas here without a stance, just showing off the real situations that military operators might face. But their presentation of these situations, contextualized within the story as always appropriate and gamified with a correct way through, implicitly says otherwise. Call of Duty knows that these missions won't vibe with everyone, but they never call those conflicts political. Because of course, the position is that the game isn't political. They just use a big catch-all word for anyone who takes issue.
Before the game's release, Clean House was a central pillar of the marketing campaign for Modern Warfare, and much of the marketing was centered around how much of a departure this story was for the series. Previous Call of Duties had been silly, explosive there. This was real. They emphasized how many military experts they consulted with, how much care they took in recreating real-life military operations. And those real-life operations, like Clean House, might be controversial. But that's what you needed to do if you wanted to accurately represent modern warfare. But far from this actually being a departure for the series, Call of Duty has continuously marketed itself on its gritty controversies. Modern Warfare 3 writers said that they wanted to show, certainly in some particular cases, we wanted to show the effects of war. Civilians are a part of that, innocent people are a part of it. Accordingly, they vaporized the little girl. Modern Warfare 2 needed to believably sell why Russia would attack the US, and that's why you shot up an airport full of civilians. Call of Duty drapes itself in surface level controversy all the time, but the controversy always boils down to kind of the same thing. Can you believe we're showing this in a video game? The controversy never goes as deep as, say, acknowledging the time that the US bombed a retreating army and all the civilians along with them. That honor is shifted to a fictional Russian operation. And honestly, many of their big controversial levels feel like clickbait more than anything. No Russian is completely disconnected from the rest of the game, and even the original team really has no consensus on what it meant. This family getting killed by a car bomb is… well, it's just that. It is a momentary unpleasant surprise that fits quite well into a headline. As Camster or Errant Signal pointed out, the shoot a baby scene in Modern Warfare is absolutely manufactured. The game doesn't even let you pull the trigger in a situation that would be friendly fire. Hard as I try, I can't shoot Captain Price. But I can shoot this baby. Call of Duty's marketed controversy is completely superficial. They show terrorist attacks and child death and deaden a player into a shell-shocked acceptance of whatever actions are taken in retaliation. Call of Duty Modern Warfare's campaign is overflowing with torture. Farah, the freedom fighter, is waterboarded at the hands of the Russian villain. In a uh, questionable choice, the torture is actually turned into a minigame. You turn your head to avoid the stream, and the villain says things like, Damn, you're good. <laughs> oh boy. There's also a scene where you enter a mansion to find that the villain has been torturing men. Two of them resisted. One gave up everything. There's also a scene where Captain Price and Sergeant Garrick are interrogating a guy named The Butcher. When he refuses to give up information, Price brings in the Butcher's wife and kid. He warns Garrick that You want the gloves off? They're off. A reference to Garrick's frustration early on with the lack of autonomy they were given in the treatment of terrorists. You as Garrick have the choice to leave or not. If you don't, Price gives you a revolver. Hey, 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 no, no, no! Please, please, we are not involved with any of this, I assure you! Hey, hey, hey! The potential death of his wife and child finally prompt the Butcher to give up the needed information and then you peace out of there with your new mission. You can kill him if you want. It doesn't really affect the story either way. This, in microcosm, is what Call of Duty believes. War is hard and often brutal but there are a few good people who have the guts and the clarity of vision to do the right thing, whatever it takes. Those people are always those who actually have their boots on the ground and never the ones who would let short-term morality stand in the way of long-term success. This isn't really even an ends justify the means ideology. One of the curious things about Modern Warfare storytelling is it's so jam-packed with missions, events, and explosions that I can't even really tell you what the intended ends were. It's more just the means are always fine if they're done by the right person. I know the people who would make the right decisions. Captain Price would do the right thing, no matter the situation. He's cited by the writers as one of the heroes of the story. Even when he uses a man's wife and child to torture him, we understand that it's okay, because he's one of the people who makes the right decisions. 
Officer Alex would do the right thing no matter the situation. And that's why the story doesn't condemn him when he leaves the CIA and joins the classified as enemy Urzik militia. The story wants you to understand that the higher administrations just don't get the war like ground level troops do. It's why, in the story, Alex parts amicably with the whole squad, instead of being called a traitor, or treasonous, or whatever. Farah, the freedom fighter, would do the right thing no matter the situation. She's strong, empathetic, and extremely cooperative with the US and British militaries. You know who can't be trusted to do the right thing? Her brother, Hadir. Because while they both want to free their country from internal terrorism and external occupation, Hadir is willing to do anything to accomplish those goals, including, in one of the game's pivotal scenes, using chemical weapons against the invading Russian army. From this moment on, Hadir is completely sectioned off from the rest of the cast, talked about in the same lingo as an enemy combatant. Hadir crossed a line, and the game's story never forgives him for it. And I mean, fair choice. Chemical warfare is a valid thing to call completely unacceptable. But Captain Price and Sergeant Herrick threaten to kill a man's wife and child in front of him, and both of those characters still come out painted as heroes. No, I think the actual reason Hadir becomes a persona non grata is because of his refusal to be fully subservient to the American and British military that come in to assist in liberation. I genuinely think that if there had come a point in the story where Price had decided to use chemical weapons against the enemy, the game would have framed it as a tough choice, but we need people that can make those tough choices to protect our freedom. I mean, for Christ's sake, in 2009's Modern Warfare 2, a different universe's Captain Price detonated a nuke directly above Washington DC, but we understood then, as we do now, that he's a man that can make the hard decisions. Modern Warfare's story and virtually every other Call of Duty plotline is one that valorizes the individual troop above civilians, ethics, and oversight. It's a story that tells us that we can't understand what's happening on the ground unless we're the people there, and as such, we shouldn't question the decisions of the soldiers who are. It's a worldview where we base our moral judgments of actions completely on the predetermined morality of the person carrying those actions out and it's a perspective that has enormous ramifications in our unavoidably political reality. Michael Behenna was an army ranger who stripped a suspected Al-Qaeda member naked during an unauthorized interrogation, then shot him twice. Matthew Goldstein is an officer who murdered a civilian in Afghanistan, a civilian he claims was a bomb maker. In his 2017 deployment, Special Ops Chief Edward Gallagher killed a 15-year-old captive with a hunting knife while the boy was receiving medical attention. He also spent days in a sniper perch, claiming to kill an average of three people a day for 80 days. Two separate SEAL snipers on the same team reported that they watched Gallagher shoot a girl in the stomach from his sniper nest. One of them guessed that she was about 12 years old. He was known to park an armored truck on a bridge and fire indiscriminately into neighborhoods. He was known to fire rockets at houses for no apparent reason. In 2014, Gallagher was detained at a traffic stop where he allegedly tried to run over a Navy police officer. In 2010, Gallagher shot through an Afghan girl to hit the man carrying her, killing them both. All three men have since received a presidential pardon. As Behenna's lawyer said, we know we have a president who is very sympathetic to the very difficult situation that soldiers, sailors, and marines were put in during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. They, in the collective cultural imagination, are the men who make the right decisions. Yes, their actions might seem immoral, bordering on inhuman from our comfortable homes, but as we're shown again and again, those inhuman actions aren't a fault, they're an imperative. These men are willing to do anything, anything, to come out on top and ultimately their willingness to set aside ethics and morals is the only way we can preserve ours. This is what Call of Duty believes.